but why is Jesus not just another moral teacher like Socrates or Buddha? Why is he not just a crazy person? Like I've met, you know, homeless people before who believe that they were God. Um, and why don't we think that he's just a legend like Hercules or something like that? What sets him apart and makes him basically like un unignorable? Yeah, the unignorable Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the one who is making dramatic claims for himself. As, as C.S. Lewis did note, Jesus is either Lord, liar, or lunatic. You know, we, when we look at Jesus, we don't see someone who is caught up in lying. He is someone who is very straightforward, very direct, uh, one who doesn't pull any punches. He's certainly not deluded. He is really the picture of mental, moral, emotional health. He is someone who is on track. So the idea that he is somehow deluded or misguided, uh, that he's really way off base psychologically, just doesn't fit what we see in the Gospels. Now, C.S. Lewis, who knew perhaps better than anyone else the distinction between history and legend, you know, we could add perhaps another L, you know, the idea of legend. Was Jesus just a legend? Were the things that he said just legendary? Well, C.S. Lewis knew that when you looked at the Gospels and you looked at legends, he could tell the difference between the two. And the Gospels are not the stuff of legends. So that was basically off the table. So if you want to have four L's, you could have four L's. But, uh, for, but for C.S. Lewis's purposes, he had already removed that from consideration because he knew what legends are and he knows what history uh, looked like. So, so we, we then come to Jesus as Lord. C.S. Lewis said we can't simply call Jesus a good moral teacher. That doesn't fit the sorts of things that Jesus said about himself. Good moral teachers don't say things about themselves like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, or uh, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, they don't say, I am the bread of life, or come to me, you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Those are the sorts of things that are said by someone who is taking the place of God, someone who assumes the authority that God alone is supposed to have. So when Jesus is making these claims, we can't simply call him a good moral teacher. Good moral teachers don't do that sort of a thing. Well, some people might object. They might say, well, Jesus didn't really say those things. It was his well-meaning followers who said those sorts of things about him. Well, that only postpones the problem. If Jesus, you know, some, you know one, one scholar, Marcus Borg, said that we have psychological categories for people who make those sorts of claims. I'm the way, the truth, the life, and so forth. In other words, these people are deluded. So it must have been the followers who did that. Well, the problem is, why are the followers making up a deluded Jesus? Why are they coming up with this unstable, uh, you know, this cracked leader? Why are they creating someone who is really not fit to be a psychologically sound leader for their movement? Why are they creating this? What makes better sense is that the sorts of things that we see in the Gospels are actually the authentic, authoritative statements that Jesus is making for himself, and that his followers were indeed warranted in believing them. Not only because uh, he said them, and that he had the ring of truth to them, that he was very believable and persuasive, but they're also, these are also accompanied by miracles, and, of course, the climactic miracle that sets Jesus apart from the rest is that Jesus rose from the dead, that he did not stay dead in the tomb. And that is why the Apostle Paul and the earliest Christian followers, or the earliest Christian leaders, they were so convinced by this message. They said, you can put us in jail, you can kill us, but we cannot stop speaking about the things that we have seen and heard. They were persuaded that something happened and if they're just making this stuff up, why would they make it up in Jerusalem? Why would they start preaching this stuff right where everything is happening? Why not do, go to Rome or to Athens and start talking there? No, they're actually going to the place where the movement can be immediately crushed because the tomb can be shown to be full of a, you know, containing a rotting body of their purported leader. 
So, but what they're doing is they're going to the place where the movement can immediately be crushed, where their claims can be immediately falsified, but that's not the sort of thing you see going on here. You see people who are bold because the tomb is empty, that Jesus appeared to them, that he is the risen Lord, and that they are willing to lay down their lives for this because this is the ultimate reality. Jesus brought about a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, Paul said, there is a new creation. So Paul is convinced, and these others are convinced, that in Jesus Christ, God is bringing about a new creation, new hope, not just for a band of Jews, but for all of humanity. That's why the message is so compelling. That's why the message is so important, that it's not just something that's true for you, but not for me. This is a message that is for all people, because it means the transformation of all lives, because the central point of reality is anchored in Jesus of Nazareth.